Hey guys, and welcome. <laughs> First of all, welcome. Uh, today is about another video for the bridge optimizer. And I want to do a little update video on the code because some things changed and nothing really on uh, terms of the functionality. Not really, but more restructuring or refactoring the code. So, um, yeah, just come with me on that ride and um, take a look at what's changed. So here we have the GitHub repository and in the code page you have this uh, commits so you can easily look that up. But uh, let's first go into the issues. So right now there are not any issues, but there are, of course, but I didn't write them until now. And um, the issue I closed was uh, more classes needed. And those can be broken down, and I broke them down into two separate things. One is um, creating classes in a data structure for handling load SPC, load collectors, load step, and whatnot. And the other thing was to do the same kind of thing um, for material property component handling. Right. So let's take them each by each. Um, and you can see also from the comments. Uh, page you can also click on any uh, comment here for example let's see here uh, restructure more classes for data structure go into here and you can see what changed right but i think it's rather difficult for you to follow um, if you just look at all the code it's better to uh, at least i think it's better to just having me explain that one times more in a shorter way because I assume that you already know a bit about uh, the structure and um, I will talk you through it. So I think it's more pleasant also for you to get an update from the code. Um, yeah, so we have here now, uh, where are we coming from? Video two of the series had three classes in total, right? So, uh, so here we have the video, right? And uh, you can see from the structure we had three classes or three files i should say three files and also i think three classes so hypermesh start a mesh and script builder and all the information was put into the mesh class and the script builder just put it the tcl commands together and it's not very tidy um so not many packages all in data structure which did not make any sense the main class was called mesh which bothered me also a bit and so i restructured all of that and yeah so let's begin so bridge optimizer is now the new mesh class and also i think i i um said that here it used to be called mesh that you can see the reference and this main class has no not any properties anymore right so i think also the imports could have uh Use some refactoring, but no, I think that's okay. So right here for the main method, you go through here and the, the first things which change here is uh, the rods. The rods are now created via a separate method. And that's actually the second part of the issue. But um, yeah, that you just see what, what changed. So rod creation and also here uh, property component. I packed that part of this the thing here into a separate method, a class method of the rod class. And then write rods is also completely renewed because it now uses the information based on the instances of the rod class and boundary conditions and loads, load step. You can see that now instances are created, right? So for a force, I really create an instance of the class force. But now this is the first part of this issue right so here uh, let's go back here to the issue so the first thing was classes for handling load spc load collector and whatnot so here loads um you saw the main class changed and also we have now a package here data structure we had that before but now we have a sub package a subfolder called hypermesh in this hypermesh folder you see different uh, files with classes in it for example, the force class you can see here, and I um, made a, a little bit of effort to just uh, document it a bit. So you have a single point force, which takes into a into a uh, parameters or the input parameters when constructing it here. 
So it takes in a load collector because every force has to have a load collector where it's um, where it's um, yeah where it's located at. And you have a x, y, and a z value, which are indicating the amount of force in the x, y, and z direction. Nothing fancy with um, custom systems, but maybe that's uh, part for a different story. And here, it's the most basic class you can think of, right? It's just a constructor here with init, and you assign the val values, and I think that's about it. <laughs> right now, I'm not even sure. Yeah. So here, it's... Yeah, that's it will get clearer because you could have the impression now this class, how is it used? Because you have no get set, whatever. Um, maybe you could get around with it. But the, the thing is, the magic happens with the load collector. The load collector has a, um, I can share that to you right here. So load collector has, first of all, here instances, and I will use that quite a bit. But what I want to show you is that... Um, it has a list called loads and this can mean loads in terms of forces but also loads in terms of boundary conditions so both can be in it as with a load collector in hypermesh you can assign um, spcs there forces pressures whatever but pressures are not done here but would be implemented in a similar manner so the load collector um, class has this instances list and because at a later point in time i want to iterate over all uh, load collector instances and for that reason whenever i create a instance by uh, by using this method the first thing or second thing here what i do is i append this instance so the instance of the load collector to the class variable instances right so Every instance of load collector has some values or some properties. But this class property is just, just one time there for the whole class. Think of it as a list of all instances of all instances I created onto a certain point. And we yeah, we, we I could show that to you if that's a thing you want to learn more about. Maybe I make a, a small sample where you can see that. But for now and uh, because I want to have that video a little bit briefer, um, I will skip that. All right, so load collector. It has this initial uh, initialize, uh, yeah, or the instantiation method. Um, then you have a get ID. So that's also a pretty uh, cool thing because you have a list which is ordered. And there you have your instances of the load collector. The ID is just the index plus one because index uh, the ID starts with one. So get ID is just a simple brief way to get this more complicated uh, equation here. All right, then we have um, load collector type. Yeah, there are different kinds of load collectors and the way I implement it right now is that you have SPC load collectors and load, load collectors, or forces. Um, the way or why I differentiate between them because I want to assign them into the load step. So load step, quickly jump over here. The load step has the same pattern with the instances, but it has a particular SPC load load collector and a load load collector. Meaning here are the boundary conditions and here are the forces. So going back, here I just find out which one is that and check also if it has an homogeneous type of loads in it. So you could imagine that you have a load collector where you have two SPCs in it and three forces. And right now that's forbidden. Even if that's possible, and I know you can use the same load collector for both, but uh, it's not possible right now here. So, all right, that's what the load collector is. And load step is, as I said, a instance which points to both a load load collector and a spc load collector and it also has this fancy get id now this is all an spc sorry i forgot that you need a boundary condition as well so single point constraint um you have the dofs which is this list of degrees of freedom so from one to six meaning xyz translational is one to three and four, five, six would be X, Y, Z rotational. And minus those six nines, 
those uh, this value means that this stuff is free so not constrained in any direction and the way you initialize a, a load collector here and i see i forgot some parameters here <laughs> so dofs is the list which comes at the end but you also need a load collector where this spc is um, located and also the node ids wherever you want this spc to happen on I have to make the documentation, but I will do that later. All right, that's about it for the first issue. Um, you see that I have now classes and I use those classes to instantiate instances of the set classes and using them in the script builder. So for the script builder, I extracted all the methods which had to do something to do with load creation into a separate class so we don't have script builder dot pi but also script builder boundary conditions dot pi this is the file and here are the the methods which are now rewritten so write tcl commands load collectors this is now i think the single method right the single method no there's another one for load steps yeah, but um, the thing is, you want to um, ultimately you want to create load steps, and for that to happen, you want to just write this method load steps. But what you are seeing here is when you're um, creating load steps, you have to know the names of the SPC and load collectors, uh, SPC load collector and the uh, load load collectors. So you have to create them in advance. So I started with writing this method and then realizing I have to create a load collectors first. And that's why this command, this method gets executed before that. So I just execute the load steps command in the main class. Sorry, where is it? In the main class, it's just script builder boundary conditions, um, write TCR commands load steps. And in this, in this method, the other method, which is above here, is also executed. So what, what's happening here? First of all, I iterate through each and every load collector. See here for load collector in load collector.instances. And here, that's the list of all instances created at that point. Now I created them and also assigned a name to them. To them. This is also cool. Then I can access the name later on, which I did um here so here i need the names there's also a trick around that you can also get it with the id and then find out a name with a hypermesh command but didn't bother here because i have the info and yeah so i created load collectors first assigning the ids and names to it and also differentiating between spcs and forces because a load collector has a set of loads and when I say loads, I mean all boundary condition, boundary conditions. As within the load collector, there are all boundary conditions possible: forces, pressures, whatever. So I go through each load collector, creating them, and then through each load assigned to them. If it's a force, then this. If it's SPC, then this. And right now, it's just homogeneous types of load collectors, meaning one load collector has only one type of um, boundary condition, either a SPC or a force right now. Pressure I don't really need for this project, but yeah, it would be nice, nice to have it for broader context. And I, I'm sure I will extend that in a future version. All right. So having created the load collectors and I call, now can create the load steps in a similar manner, I iterate through each load step and also have the ID and yeah, this is about it, right? Just assigning the IDs correctly. And it's also just static. And I know it's it could be a lot better. But for the purpose of this optimizer, it's fair enough. And yeah, I marked some to-dos where I maybe want to put a little bit of effort into it in the future. Right, so this is covers all the things which is necessary for the first issues to be closed. So to recap, bridge optimizer, we now created instances rather than just having the information in the main class and then just making the TCL commands and putting all the TCL commands in a separate class. 
And yeah, that's about it. This script class is using then the instances to create the TCL commands. And that's about it. Now, the second part is actually the part happening before that is uh, with the rods. And I use the same structure here as well to create a rod.py. This is just a class which is really not a hypermesh entity, but it is used to create one. So a class rod has material, diameter, node IDs for start and end node and a flag if it's an optimization rod, because later on I want to maybe remove all the non-optimization rods, or of course I want to change the property on it. But that's the whole reason behind it. I have to have a different property for optimization rods than for non-optimization rods. Now, um, we can instantiate um, this rod class by just giving the parameters as above. We have this instances pattern again, and also here is a dictionary. This dictionary uh, works like that. You give a key and get a value back. Just like imagine a librarian, you give a code to it and the librarian knows where and which book this is referring to. So the dictionary tells me to which node pair which rod instance is meant to be. It's just a way to quick, yeah, quicker get the rod instance later on, not having to iterate over all instances and find the right rod. And it's just an assignment here, and I have a class method, create rods. So here the rods are created. And this is the thing taken with the distance, the neighbor distance threshold, which we covered in the mesh.class um, in mesh.py in the last video. So here it's the same thing, but um, the TCL command is not executed, it's just the instance which is now created. And I also created another method here, toggle optimization, which just switches the toggle the optimization on or off, which I will use in the future. And then the model entities, this is referring to the model entities here, which is basically the material, the property, and the component. I skipped the beam section because I don't think it's really necessary because all what you want to do is give a diameter because that's all what's um, implemented right now and I think I don't need any more. Um, yeah, but maybe that will also change in the future. So going back to rot.py, it creates the model entities based on that, that you have a property and a component for each rot. All right, going back to the main class, you can see how this is created here. So rod dot create rods creates all the rods. Then you create all the model entities and then you write a TCL create rods. This is also new because this is now using the instances rather than just having it in plain TCL. So in there, it's a little bit difficult because First, I just created for each and every rod a separate property, separate beam section, separate component even. But then I realized it's not a good idea for the optimization uh, to have a lot of properties because then you would have to use a design objective reference. And that's not a good idea for me at the moment because optimization, I think it's getting a lot difficult, more difficult. So I use just, if it's an optimization rod, I just use one property limiting myself that I can only use a same diameter for every rod, but that's also a good thing, I think. And now here you can see it iterates through all the rod instances. And if the optimization ID is zero, that means it's the beginning. Uh, that's the beginning. In the beginning, it's like that. Or if it's not a optimization rod, then this is executed, meaning here it creates the material, the property, the component and stuff like that. And then it changes also the optimization ID to the rod ID, which this is where this is occurring. So every rod has an ID. And you can think of rod one has property underscore one, material underscore one, component underscore one. And when the first rod is found, which has an optimization, for example, four, and this ID is the optimization property, property for material for, etc. And then I don't have to create another uh, property component for optimizations. That's why this is now as an if 
if you have a um, rod optimization, so this is uh, not rod optimization, this is false, right? No, this is true. Uh, rod optimization is true. So this is false. So it's not going that. And optimization ID you changed here. So it will not, for the second optimization rod, it will not go into that block anymore. But just use uh, the ID, which is already here. And here, if a rod is an optimization rod, the ID is the optimization ID you found, or else it's a rod ID. And then you put this rod or this ID into the rod parameter and put the command here. That's basically it. It's a bit difficult um, to understand maybe for the first time, but if you read through it and think yourself through the code, I hope it gets more clear. All right, I think that's um, about it. And I think just to show you what it's um, doing here, I will execute it as the execution method also changed. It's now executed like a module. So Python minus M, M for module, and now bridge optimization uh, dot bridge optimizer, optimizer, <laughs> optimizer. And if you do it like that, Hypermesh should start. Maybe I it could be that I um, disabled that, yeah, because of the scripting. But it's also okay. Now we can look in the code. Here you have the section where you create the nodes. Maybe I run it once more, then we don't have to wait for it to finish. Right now it's booting up. And if you see through the TCL commands, all right, so you have the first block here with the create nodes. Then you have your first material property component block. And now you have just the rods. Because I don't have any non-optimization rods, it's just that. And you have here your, all your elements. Then you have your load collectors, SPC loads, whatever, and then the optimization. That's everything. All right, so I will be right back when this is executed and show you the final results. And yeah, it seems good. Um, compared to the last iteration on video number two, it's smaller in size because then I don't have to wait this long if I'm just iterating and checking if the design works. But this should now work if I just make our simple Optistruct run here. See if that works, but uh, pretty sure it does. It's it's not it's not perfect, and here I can start talking a little bit about my ideas on how to move this project further. So um, for this, what you're seeing here. You have just elements from one to another node. There's no element from here to here. Well, but either way, what I want to do next is to just make a different property for those rods. So those rods are set. They are cannot be left away. Sorry, the Licensing sometimes doesn't work here. I'm supposing that it is on the cable internet because if I rerun it, it works. I don't know why. Some timeout setting. But what you can see here. So this is not a design proposal, right? It makes sense. It wants to minimize the mass, but also constraining this. Um, this the deflection of this node but for a bridge it would not have any elements here so what i thought would be interesting was and i can maybe do that quickly manually here i think this should also make some i don't know something like this but also linking this element and also this, this, and maybe here, and here, here. We will see about this.
So optimization has converged. And there's a lot of things we can do now, uh, next, if this works, right? So um, playing around with the p-value or the penalty component. Yeah, so we will have a lot to do. So. All right, <laughs> this was not intended. <laughs> Seems like it has gotten rid of everything. But this would indicate to me that the uh, displacement constraint is far too um, small. Because now it's, yeah, it's moving to the power of minus fifth. You see here that um, the, the deconstraint value or how to set it is rather important, right? So let's just quickly um, to see if that is the case and then I will leave you alone with that to see if this to the power of minus, minus five. Let's make something like four or three. Hmm. Let's go with that. And then also you, you could you also make the constraint not a total but just the constraint in y direction. So there's a lot of playground. And maybe this is also just to to less elements because you don't have any points in between, so it's rather Yeah, you know, there's so many, many things you could do. Now, let's see the min mass. You have a constraint violation. But that's good, because if the constraint violation is active, it's set to the um, to the limit. So it's active. That's that's good. So you see me as uh, just playing around a little bit, right? But here you can see now, yeah, this is what I was for, uh, thinking. So you have something like this and both are connected. All right, I'll leave it at that, folks. Um, thanks again for watching. If you like uh, like that video, please <laughs> consider subscribing, liking the video. If you have any questions, comments, feel free to comment as well. And also to contribute to the code if you want to. And um, yeah. For that being, uh, I hope you have a good time and see you on the next video. Goodbye.